Well, as people are joining us, I just want to give a quick intro to Jenna. Uh, I I think this is uh, Nashville. I used to live in Nashville. Um, so Jenna had a 15 year career, year career in healthcare, and she made the move over to uh, Acadian House Design and Ren Renovation. And um, oh, real quick, before I get started, sorry to interrupt myself. I am launching a poll. If you guys wouldn't mind answering those quick questions for me, I just hit launch on that. So if you are online and in the chat, uh, make sure that to grab that poll. Uh, I'll continue with my introduction. So anyway, Jenna had a 15-year uh, career in healthcare and then made the move over to this industry. And I'm going to say a little bit about Acadian real quick for Jenna. Uh, but they complete over 60 projects per year with six in-house designers. Uh, and when Jenna came in, uh, she overhauled the CRM system. She brought on Company Cam, shout out Company Cam, uh, as a project management software um, to streamline communication and fix some issues. But I think what's really cool, and I have to say congrats to Jenna for being named 40 Under 40, which Thank is amazing so and Thank awesome. You. I'm really excited about it. Uh, for general operations and production managers. And so I'm going to let her talk about all that. But first, I got to ask Jenna, how did you go from healthcare to, to saying, hey, let's let's dive into uh, construction renovation or just the industry at large? Like, what was that move like and what spawned that? I'm, I'm going to try and make this as short as I can. Um, I loved the, the healthcare system and what I was doing. I was in surgery and um, I really enjoyed it. But I got married and had two children and it just became more important to me to be valued. And I felt that at home. And so I really kind of wanted to scale back and how much I was giving myself to the the healthcare system. Um, yeah. And when 2020 hit and, and the pandemic, it was a perfect opportunity for me just kind of to realize that it was time for me to really make a big change. Also, I didn't feel like I was being used properly as far as leadership. I had a lot to give within uh, the leadership program in the healthcare system and where I was, and and they didn't allow me to progress with that. And I really wanted to do that. So I looked into this job as an assistant to the owner. And then two years later, now I'm, I'm, GM uh, for them. So within that two year system, I just kind of went through a boot camp with um, the owner as a mentor of mine. And she just, I just fell in love with this industry so much with not just the design aspect of it, but the process of start to finish and how we do everything from the design to in, to all of the selections and then the construction side of it. So watching something grow from start to finish was amazing. And I fell in love with it. And so here we are. As I've lost my camera. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was such a good story. It startled me and then it, I lost my camera. Um, no, but that, but that is amazing. And um, one of the things that I did want to talk about with you, and we're going to get to things like quiet quitting and how to, you know, what that leads to hiring, obviously just streamlining operations, which is something that you were involved with, but yes. let, let's start at the very beginning. What is the current state of skilled trades labor in your opinion? So, I mean, in, in my opinion, we definitely have a shortage of that skilled um, labor. I have some t statistics for you guys that I kind of want to share that I just recently went through and found um, and about about the why behind it. Like, we know that it's there, but why did this happen? And because it happened very quickly. Um, mm. and it looks like, you know, 2020, what they did, what the industry did was they called it the great resignation. And I am part of that. They, people are jumping, trying to find the happiness. They were home for so long. They enjoyed what, what they were doing, whether it was remote working or, or just finding something else to provide them income. Um, and in 2022 is really when we felt that punch in the gut. And there was 50 million people just within 2022 that quit their jobs, that, that resigned, which all prompted, which now we call um, the great reshuffle, where people are just trying to find their way still um, in an ever-changing economy and um, just finding themselves pushing toward, toward what they want, kind of like I did. But um, all that being said, the skilled labor is really what we see. I would say carpentry is one of the bigger ones where mm -hmm. we see where they walked away from that because building and things like that just wasn't progressing. Um, so people are trying to find things uh, that that they that they want to do long term. Um, but I, I truly believe that's where the skilled labor 
currently is right now is just we we need more of that. It's interesting. So I was just going to comment on the poll we took and just kind of seeing some of the answers so far. Biggest barrier to hiring right now is finding reliable employees. Um, right. There's a lot of people that want to work, but yeah. it's skilled labor that we can't find. Anybody can come and knock on my door and say, look, I want a job. But like yeah. the quality that we want to give our clients, we really need that skilled labor. Like this is what you want to do. You need to be very good at it and skilled for us to to move forward with you. And we just can't find that right now. It's interesting too. A lot of the when we asked the jobs hiring there, the votes across everything. So we saw sales, marketing, office admin, installers, managers, foremen, et cetera. But it's interesting that office admin kind of led the way. And then uh one of the biggest uh they were talking about the biggest barrier is finding that reliable employee. Second is finding the experience. And then um, it, most interesting, and we're going to get to all this about training and stuff, but we asked how much time do you spend on training four plus hours was the most checked versus anything less. So yeah. definitely more hours than not is spent training uh, with those that are joining us today. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I would say our information, like what we do for our training process is when I came on, we didn't necessarily have a curriculum. We knew what we had to do to train them properly, but I, I needed a curriculum for them so I could stay on track to make sure that we're giving them the opportunity to truly learn and and provide for us. Um, So we do a three month curriculum, training curriculum for each, whether it's office admin, designer, warehouse management, project management, or our subcontractors, because even our subcontractors that don't necessarily work under the Acadian House name, even they have a curriculum to follow and rules to follow to work for Acadian House. And that has been pivotal in our training where it's three months and then that's it instead of like a six month to a year process of, oh, well, man, we didn't do that yet. Now mm -hmm. we know but, and and everybody almost goes through the same thing because I need my project manager to know what my designers do. And I need my designers to know what project management do. So does, excuse me. So that's why I take all those curriculums and I really kind of mold it into one. We, we're kind of talking about the ones that are in the most demand. But if we kind of drill down on um, whether you're looking for sales or admin or, you know, people that are, you know, part of the production crew, their installers, et cetera, et cetera. But where, in your opinion, if you're like, okay, where do I find the applicants? If there's these people that want to work, there's these people that I need, I'm trying to find skilled labor. Where do you begin? Whether it would be where you currently are, or if you were anywhere in the country, I guess, where would you start or where would you suggest people to find the best possible pool of applicants? So what we do is, first and foremost, we have a process for that, and we don't stray away from this process. So um, obviously, we do paid ads, whether it's through Instagram, Facebook, or, or Google. We do those ads to make sure like that's seen. But we look. We go on, on LinkedIn, dominantly on LinkedIn, and we look and see where we can find some of these applicants. Instead of just waiting for this to fall in our lap, we actually go and get interest within LinkedIn. Um, once that starts, we send them to our website and then we go through our process and it's it's a Zoom meeting first and then it's an uh, in-person meeting um, for all of our in-office like admin, um, admin or uh, designers, anything that's like in-office. And if it's subcontractors, we have a, a very long, tedious meeting with them about quality and quality control for them. And then we even go to some of their job sites that they've worked on for other employers and look at that to make sure that it's, it's comparable. But dominantly, we are looking on LinkedIn for those applicants. It's interesting. There is a staff from a Job Nimbus Peak Performance Report that three in five roofers are looking to hire a sales rep in 2024. So I, it's like with our poll that we ran and then seeing this, it's admins, but also sales. And even in the contractor interviews that I've done recently with company cam or the good contractor podcast, like I hear that a lot too, is how do I clear the road for my salespeople to go out and sell? And how do I take this off of them and all that? So it's interesting that we're talking about all these, you know, and everybody's different, right? Everybody has a different need, but it's interesting that, um, you know, like what, where, where you're finding it. Can I stay on the LinkedIn thing for just a second? Cause Lauren brought up yeah. an interesting point. She said, Lauren said, are you finding skilled labor on LinkedIn too? We haven't had that same success using LinkedIn for production, but LinkedIn has been great. She says for our office roles. So what, 
to her question, are you looking for certain roles on LinkedIn and then going elsewhere for say skilled labor? Or are you finding all of it there as well? Lauren, I think that's a, that's an awesome question. We're heavily involved in the chamber of commerce within um, within our demographic of what we work and also the Home Builders Association and teaming up, honestly, teaming up with other builder contractors and getting information from them and how they feel about some of the people that they work with has been very beneficial for us trying to, to find our, our skilled workers. Now, granted, our Acadian House has had some of the same subcontractors for 10 years, 15 years now. We're, we do very good at trying to be loyal to the people that we work with, which that is huge when you find someone doing the doing what you need to do to keep them um, with you is, is huge. So you're not constantly looking to fill that void. Um, but I think that if you get involved in the chamber and the HBA and really kind of team up with some of these other builder contractors will really help you look in on the internal and see where they're close to you and what who's working with who. Um, and at that point, I think you can really pull in some very good skilled labor because they're already in that region. One of the, Lauren, yes, as great as thanks for answering. One of the things that's interesting on the discussion of finding the right applicants is obviously compensation right and and that's a big part of not just rewarding but retaining employees interestingly enough you've got a u.s average um for roofers right now i'm looking at this stat you have eighty one thousand plus a 10 percent bonus you've got sales positions you have installer positions performance bonuses commissions benefits in your mind and i know that's a lot and there's a lot of different positions and i know it varies from position, but just in general, when you're trying to hire the best applicants, what it, what does a payment structure look like? What's important when you are looking for those applicants to not just hire the best, but obviously separate yourself from somebody else that is also looking to hire great applicants for these positions? So I'll kind of start with the beginning, like our our, our sales and our design, because we have a you know we have a front end that kind of pulls into our design system. So we really kind of do um, a commission based pay. Um, there is there's the base pay, but then there's commission, and there's no cap to that. We mm. want you to make as much money as you can possibly make. There's no no cap to that at all. So on that part of it, on the design portion of it and, and our sales, it really is, you know, following your KPIs and us giving them the tools that they need to succeed. The compensation kind of lies in their lap. What do you want to make? If you want to make this much, I'm willing to invest whatever I need to, to get the leads for you to make that dollar amount. And that's a huge thing that we do, um, not to jump to, to the next thing, but that's a huge thing we do in our employee evaluations as well. How much do you mm. want to make? What do you need? Because yeah. I don't know how much to invest into this, into our, into our marketing and, and lead generation to make sure that they, they do make that much. Now we obviously have KPIs that they have to follow and we have a bottom line that we have to make as a company, but for them to make the most, we need to know what, you know, where they're at with that. Um, as far as our subcontractors go, our skilled laborers, laborers, we sit with them and we talk about their pricing compared to what Acadian House expects. Um, and then we just partner with them and say, you know, like if it's, if it's, you know, what are they willing to, you know, if we, if we're willing to give you 95% of the work and we're guaranteeing that or, or partially guaranteeing that, what are you willing to come, um, you know, to come with, cause we don't, they're not Acadian house employees. They're just subcontractors. So we have to make sure that we align with their pricing too. Where does Acadian house pricing align with the subcontractors pricing? And we have very open and honest conversations about that. And it has worked great for us. Um, also because we are so loyal to our subs. You know, I was going to ask, this is not on our sheet, but I just thought this was interesting. And I want to stay here for a second. Um, I love that you have prioritized the retention as much as the, you know what I mean? The hiring process. And because the, the more I talk to people that are in any, whether, no matter what the trade is, it's always about how do I set this person up for success? If I'm loyal to them, they're loyal to me. It's like this combined effort. When you were thinking about just retaining and how that's so important and what does that retaining structure look like? Can you just talk about, for you and, you know, with Acadian and, and why that was such a huge priority. And then 
outlining i just think it's helpful for those that are joining us too like how do you outline what it means to do well enough to retain employees where they feel good about it? is it just like you said asking that question of what do you need you know like yeah. what do you need to stay here what what does that look like for you when you think about good retaining like principles and strategy i do think it is a broad problem that leadership in general across the board in the United States that we don't have enough leaders in a position to say, how can I help? Mm. You know, if there is a problem, I want to know what I did first to, to, to initiate this or what, what I didn't do. And that's why we have the issue. Um, so I'm always asking, how can I help? Or let's look into this immediate conflict resolution. That is huge for retaining instead of wiping it or washing it under the rug, immediate mm. conflict resolution, whether that's between employees, employee sub, or whether that's just an issue that we've had with a client. We, you have to attack that immediately. Um, I can go through some other things. We have flexibility within our working schedule, um, obviously within reason, but we all know that some people, it may not be a financial um, uh, drive that they have. It may be where I, I just need a little more time with my kids. I want to go with muff I want to go to muffins with mom. So I'm very flexible with that. I have two kids myself. I don't miss or I try not to miss anything. And I'm very lucky that I have an organization that does that. I will be here forever because of that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, acknowledge all the time when the when the good things are done we mm. discuss when the things are not so done so great or the kpis aren't being met but we always acknowledge when things are going great um, and that includes monthly team building we do weekly team meetings to discuss any issues so again immediate conflict resolution um and in community involvement all things like that where you do it as a team but i think sticking having a solid mission and vision statement a mission statement and a vision and making sure that your employees understand that a hundred percent is going to work wonders for you as retaining your, 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 your team members. Um, our company culture is solid and I will fire you quickly if you do not stick to that value of our vision and our company culture. And I mean that with every ounce of myself, because I feel like if you don't align with the vision we have, we just can't be we, we can't be, you know, and, I, and I'll go through coaching to make sure that I've done the best I can to get you to this. But if you don't see that vision that we all see as a team, you just won't work with us. And sure. I think, you, have, you know, leaders have to understand that. I hate to say it like this, but, you know, um, hire real slow, take a long time to do it. Make sure you're asking those right questions. Melissa, I want to get to your question, too. I think there's yeah. some points I want to hit, too. But ask really good questions in in the um interviewing process, take time to do that. It doesn't have to be a knee jerk decision. If you think this person, Oh, I like, I like this person. Like you will have that. It, it will work out if you just take your time and ask those questions and fire fast. When you see that they're not aligning to you and your company and you're doing what you can to make sure that you're training them properly and they're still not there. I mean, you know, uh, I can either lead you or manage you when I can't lead you, I will manage. And when I can't manage, I'm done. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm quick to pull the trigger on that uh, just because the vision that we have at Acadian house is, is, you know, it, it's a, it's a standard of, of trust that we have within our team members just to follow. Yeah. Melissa brings up a really good question. And I, throughout my career as managing folks and doing countless interviews, this is, I think this is a great one because it, it this can happen. And, and she said, she, I would love to know more about the interviewing process, especially asking good discerning questions. She says, I've found people say yes to most questions such as, are you organized, et cetera. But when they start working, I find that's not true at all. Are there any examples of interview questions that would be helpful? And that's a good one because it's like, what questions can I ask that are going to be indicators of future success, failure, performance, et cetera? Mm -hmm. What would you, what would you say are good interview questions maybe to help with that? I'm going to first point that and point out and and challenge anyone that's on this webinar right now to start implementing a disc study. This is a personality study and we do it with every single person that fills out the application that makes it to the Zoom process before we even Zoom I send this to them and it's 
really simple to find a disc study for you to do. And it tells you, are they dominant at like, as, as far as like getting things done, we'll run over anybody to get it done. You know, are they the, the otter of the group? Do they make everybody laugh? Is, are they sociable? Are they super organized? Like, you know, are, are, are mm. they go-getters? So like, we have an idea of who you are before we even meet you. Um, and that is a huge thing for you to ask better questions because now you know, well, if it's a super dominant person, I want to know how you resolve conflict resolution because the whole, because I said so is not, it's not going to, it doesn't fly with, with your team members. So right. I want to know that how, how, you know, so at that point, when I find that, when I get to the disc study and I see what type of, what type of personality trait you have within your work environment, I know the better questions to ask. Uh, Tim said, what's the name of that personality study website? Is there a website for that study? Oh, that's a good question. I, I'm sure we do, and, but I don't have it. I don't have it available to me right Is now. It, go ahead and spell it for me and I'll at least put the name in there. It's just so. D-I-S-C, DISC, a DISC okay. study. It's a personality trait. There's, I'm going to be honest, there's hundreds of them. There's so many um, that you can go into. It's just find the one that works best for you. Um, I've taken several of them since I've been in a leadership position. And it's, it's funny sometimes like within the first year, it has changed now that I'm in a different role and in a different position. Um, but making sure, and also we do, we, we make our employees now do it like every three years, we're getting ready to do a big team bond building and team bonding, um, where everyone reduced their re they will they they will redo their disc study and then we will review it with everyone. I also before I talk to a team member uh, with a hard conversation, I pull their disc study and it even tells you how to resolve conflict with this type of personality. And so my whole conversation changes um, just yeah. because I have that as a tool. It is amazing and it has changed leadership for me because now I know the proper way to to address things with these people. And it teaches the great lesson that you can't manage in everybody the same because it's, you know, we're all unique and yeah. that's, yeah. And with that, um, let's move to training and development once yeah. they're hired and once you've gone through this and now it's like, okay, uh, I want to give this person, uh, the best possible opportunities to, to succeed, not just for our benefit, but for their benefit as well. Let's start with just time. And whether it's in just the beginning or it's after a while, how much time do you feel is appropriate or the best to spend on just training in general? For Acadian House, we found that a three month span of a training of training is a perfect number for you to get through all of it. And then at the back end, even if you finish early on some of these things, um, I feel like the back end of those still keep it at three months, but have them ask the questions at this point, instead of you saying today, we're going to work on, you know, have them kind of veer themselves into the, the things that they need, but that's toward the end of it. Um, our curriculum is a three month curriculum. We have it week by week. It starts off where they're with me and it's everything HR. It is getting all of their apps on the phone, all their computer stuff, designated and ready. I mean, down to getting the key to the building and the alarm code for them. So that yes. full, first full week is all me. And then um, we use our veteran employees through this process. I cannot teach them everything. I'm not a designer. I didn't go to design school. I cannot teach you 2020. Um, so I have my veteran designers know that this week you're going to be followed and I need you to be 100% on board with this. We talk about it. I get them ready for it. I make sure that the timeline fits within their workload also, because I do not want to add to that because that causes burnout. So I make sure all those things, all those boxes are checked off. I'm okay skipping here and there as far as like week one, then maybe week two can't, the, the person I need is too busy. So I'll go to four, but I try to, I try to stick to that, but everyone's on board with this. Um, and having that curriculum, it has actually shortened our three month period, but I still keep it there because I want it. We just see where when we let them loose at three months, there are no questions after that. So the curriculum and sticking to it is so important, but pulling in your veteran people that, you know, can help you along the way. Um, as far as like, you know, that this singular person is excellent at Excel or 2020 
or warehouse management? Where are we keeping all of the things that we're getting? And how do you get it to the client's house? How do I know that the client that I'm supposed to be taking care of, project management now, that that I'm supposed to tell our towel installer that you have to be here this day? How do I know that all this tile is going here? So like making sure that the steps in the process are shown and all the way through. Interesting. Uh, Tim has a question. He said, how much time should you spend on classroom training, like training off on job training, meaning not out in a field, not out at a project site, not out doing something where you're balancing the workload? How much would you spend on the like the classroom type training versus on job training, in your opinion? Um, as far as the front end, obviously, it would be a lot like our sales um, anything like operations with internal sales or our designers, all of that is going to be heavily within the office. I would say in our three month process, two months are going to be in the office. And the last one is just to have an eye on the job site. And, um, and, and that's because we have so many, um, so much software and apps that we provide for our, our team that that's where I kind of hint in on that. When it comes to project management, there aren't so many things within the office that they need to know. And so I will only do maybe three weeks of, of hands-on or like in office training with them and everything else is in the field. And again, I go back to the disc study because I want to know how they learn as well. If they learn more by a book, I will put them more to the book. But if they need hands-on training, I'm a hands-on person. I have to see it. So from my training was all do it. I had to do it to make sure. See, you know, like see one, do one, teach one. That's how my, my mentality was. So like, I always ask, what's your best form of learning. And then that's how we kind of, tr we, we trade it or we treat that specific employee. I can't stress enough that you have to know who you're talking to. And I don't mean the name. I mean, the person that you're talking to, how can you, what can you do to best get everything out of them? And once you find the answer to that, it, it's, it'll, it'll open up such a, a wide range of knowledge for you and your employee. We talked about this at the beginning, but the very popular phrase, especially, you know, pre or post COVID and everything that had occurred is quiet quitting. Can you tell me as you're scaling a team and we've talked about hiring and training and retaining. And so this falls under that retaining category. But when you look at quiet quitting, so to speak, um, how do you. It's interesting that we phrased it this way, because I thought this is really a great way to say, instead of just saying, well, how do you keep people from quitting? You know, it's like you said it in a way of how do you keep your team engaged in the mission to the point where I guess it's I shouldn't say fighting back against quiet quitting mm -hmm. or loud quitting, if that's even a thing. Maybe I just made up that phrase. <laughs> uh, but I guess how do you keep them engaged to where the quiet quitting isn't so much of a concern? So first, I kind of want to go over what quiet quitting. I had yeah. no idea exactly what the term was. And someone said it at a, at a leadership meeting that I had gone to. And I was like, well, that makes perfect sense. But quiet quitting isn't necessarily like just not doing their work. It's only doing their work and yeah. not anything extra. And how do we get them to be motivated to not just hit that KPI, but go over it? And I think, first of all, financially, we don't have a cap on that. So we already push them to make us, you know, you're, you have all the capability in the world to make as much money as you want, but how do you do that? We give them all the tools and resources that we possibly can um, for for them to succeed. So 2020 design, we have the most updated in that. Um, HubSpot is our CRM system. It's extremely easy to use. Our designers are, it, it gives them tasks. So it's not something that they have 50 or 500 sticky notes everywhere. Um, we use Grasshopper so they don't have to use their personal numbers um, and get bothered at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and I, like, most importantly is comp cam. And I know that we're on a comp cam. You know, like I, I understand, but comp cam is so big within our, within our company. It changed our project management so much. Um, and it helped take 
the stress off of what is happening on my job site. What is happening? Because it was very stressful for our designers because for a long time within Acadian House, our design team was also our project management. And as we've grown, we've had to add addition, obviously additional roles and one was project management. But our design team really wants to know that this beautiful project that they put together and all this time that it's it's being implemented properly. And now ComCam has allowed us to have a live view every day of what is happening, what has been done, and our project and and our project manager and design team can talk to each other through this as well. Project manager takes a picture of a hole in the wall. Designer says, well, that's not supposed to be there. Project manager says, already on it, I got it fixed. And they do that without having to step away from the office. Huge. It has been our time management is better. Our productivity is better because we're not worried about those things or having to pull our design team out of their offices. So um, I'll tell you, giving them the best software and apps available for them to, to not have that stress on them is huge when it comes to quiet quitting and pushing them to do more because now we're giving them all the tools to do it. Totally. William has a question and Tim's got a question. I've got more questions. This is all good stuff. Uh, and thank you for the company cam shout out. That was, yeah, yeah, I'm glad that most importantly, not that it's a shout out, but I, I think for us, it is about seeing it actually benefit because there is so much to where, you know, taking a photo and just the, the having proof of something, it's not, you know, a lot of times like, oh, it's proof in case something goes wrong. Well, sometimes it's just proof for communication sake, like you said, to keep from having to go out and go see it. So uh, that's, that means a lot. William asked, is there any recommendations on improving the communication with your team? I feel like sometimes you can burn them out with the emails, uh, et cetera. We utilize uh, CCAM or company camp as well, which is great scheduling, but I just feel like sometimes there can always be room for improvement. What would you say just communicating with those current employees? Uh, best practices, I guess, would be the way to ask that in terms of not yeah. – I guess there is that balance of not over, you know, under communicating, but also not burning them out with, with constant communication. Right. The thing that our team um, this year, especially it was across the board on the evaluations was I have been in the office face to face with them five days a week. And I know that's not possible for all employees. I get that. And especially with our subs that, that they don't see me either. But as far as communication goes, like I said earlier in it, like immediate conflict resolutions, if you're looking for like, how do I communicate issues with them? Do it immediately, whether it's a phone call, you know, and, but just in general, I mean, we do weekly meetings with each other to make sure that those emails can wait. I'm not going to send five emails unless it's an emergency, mm -hmm. but I'm not sending five emails over this week or 10 or 15 emails, I'm going to wait till we have that team meeting and we're going to discuss it then because it gives them, now you're giving, you're giving them some of, of the power to, to make these changes. Like I said, I can't say what's best for, for change. I can on project management. I can on business. I can on comp cam, but I can't on the design aspect of it. So getting your team members in these meetings and asking their opinion, their suggestions, and I can't say this enough actually doing it, <laughs> doing what we talked about. I had yeah. a list 15 pages long when I first started. Cause I just, I'm like, well, I don't know if I can just implement this, implement it. If it doesn't work, you can go back to what it was. And your team is going to tell you, this is not working. And I always ask, Hey, we made that change this week. How's that working? And if mm -hmm. I get good feedback, we roll with it. If I don't get good feedback, I pull it immediately. I am not going to test something and it already is causing issues. And then we continue to do it. So communicating face-to-face -face with an employee in our company has been best. I do. I, I like to cook. And our showroom is a working showroom. So I cook for our subs once a month. So at that point, I have direct contact with my subs. I can tell them the things that I don't like they're doing. I can tell them the things that I love that they're doing. And then they can communicate any issues with me. And we do that once a month. Now, you have to delegate what is very important to you and then what is not so important and can wait. Mm -hmm. If it's extremely important, send the email. They're just going to have to get over it. If, they, if it can wait, wait on it and do it collaboratively as a team. And then that it eliminates all those emails where, where they don't want to read them, you know, and then it gives them a little bit of um, a, a little bit of courage to be able to speak up because you're willing to listen and implement. I love that. I love the cooking. I wish I could be there for that. That sounds <laughs> awesome. Um, Tim asked two questions. Number one, to use the train Yule app 
T-R-A-I-N-U-A-L app. And if not, what do you use instead? Right. Assume for training digitally. I don't use any apps for training. I'm so old school. Um, and and maybe I will start to look into that. Thank you for dropping that. But I am. You're not old school. You're using company cam. And you've got no, for sure. That was huge. That was a huge step. <laughs> but I have, it's all paper. Like I sat down with yeah. each part of our company, each department. And I said, I need you to write down everything you do start to finish. I need to know everything you do. And then I built a working process from start to finish. And at that point, that's where I created, um, that's where I created our, our curriculum. So that's something that I implemented two years ago was starting the curriculum. And it's, it's not a training app. It is so old school, but I use it. I take information from each department and then I, I create a curriculum of like our project management obviously doesn't need to know how to do 2020, but he also needs to know how to read it. So we take that portion of our training and he sits in on that. So it, it kind of works like that. It's it's all paper. I could show you, but it's literally it's paper. <laughs> hey, if it works, it works. It works. Uh, it works he, Tim, had also asked about, do you kind of the effect of training um on engagement his question was do you feel if an employee is properly trained that that equals helps or does make the biggest difference in terms of them being engaged so how much does training affect employee engagement uh in oh, the overall I, goal I would say the company? A lot. Yeah. yeah yeah a lot i mean if you don't have an employee that knows what's going on within their own job description, they're not going to be involved in the conversation. I need yeah. you to be involved in the conversation. And if you're not confident in what you're doing, you're not going to have a voice. And all those concerns that you have, again, this goes back to quiet quitting, all those concerns that you have is just going to sit on you. And this is coming from experience that I had within healthcare system. I never felt like I had a voice and I wanted to change that. And the only way I felt like I could have that voice is if I had the knowledge behind it. So giving them the knowledge, making Making sure that they're properly trained, will they will get involved in the conversation to help any other people that may not know as much, or or maybe doing it a little different, and they have a, a better way, or you know, or a suggestion to do it differently. So I think it's important that you train and and they're properly trained because I feel like they're going to be more involved and engaged within the company, and in your strategic planning for even the next year. Like quarter one this year, we had quarterly meetings. Our quarter one meeting was basically not what happened in quarter one. We talked a little bit about that, but how can we do better for next Q1 for 2025? So it's more or less having a plan that continues into the future and looking at what you're doing that you can do better and giving your employees that information. They will stay engaged if they don't have to guess. That's interesting. Not looking to Q2, looking at next year's Q1. That's really awesome. Um, okay, you've trained them. They're engaged. You started them with one week of HR training, make sure they have all the equipment and stuff like that. But as they get comfortable in their role, how do you scale the output? Meaning, I know you did this in your first six weeks. Mm -hmm. Now we got to take this up a notch to get where you want to go and where we want to go. If you're thinking about, because I, I, to me, this is me geeking out about manager stuff just from my past. I, I love to hear strategies. It's like, I think it's not the quiet quitting where I'm only doing what I'm asked to do. It's more the, I can do all this, but how do I do more? Meaning I want to take the next step in my career. And as the company, we want to scale the output because we want to grow as well. So how, what is scaling output of those employees that are engaged, that are trained? Uh, what does that look like to you? Well, we do, we have um, self-evaluations. I want to know how you feel like you did. We have employee um, evaluations. Obviously that's what we do as management team. Um, and then we do team member evaluations and those are spread out through the year. We, we don't make them do it like January one. Um, mm -hmm. But to make sure that they stay on track, we obviously have KPIs and we are, we are extremely transparent on what we need for this company to run. Um, and then their KPIs consist of uh, just, for example, our conversion percentage, we know that if we hit a certain conversion conversion percentage, that that dollar amount of our budget, or you know, that what we want to hit for revenue for the year, is met. As long that is that is the least. This is the least you need to do for you 
to meet your KPIs. So we're transparent with the amount of like, we want to make X amount of dollars this year. And for you to do that for us, we need you to have, I'm just going to spit some numbers, a hundred leads, which converts at a 75% out of those that have converted. I need them 90% to convert to pricing and 40% to convert to um, construction. Like th that's how we explain it. So they don't have a guesswork of, well, I hope I'm on track. They know because they have all of the real transparent numbers that they need. They also know that if I go over this number, I'm going to make a lot more too. So now they know what they have to do to exceed those expectations. And it's not something, you know, we, we try to find self-driven people. Again, that goes back to the DIS study. I need you to be self-driven because there's only so much that I can do to get you there. But, you know, if, if it's financial, we can get you there. If it's a personal growth, we can get you there. So transparency with those things are important. Um, for them to meet, at least meet the KPIs and keep them on track. Um, we also do a lot of team building. I know it sounds so cheesy, but we do. We go bowling. We might have like a cocktail hour. We have a fantastic Christmas party. So like keeping them engaged, feeling it very much like a family is what our employees want. I, I, you know, that's just, you have to find what works within your, within your company, but our, our, company culture is extremely family oriented. And so um, I actually had an employee the other day that was like, was sick, was out sick. And she was texting me like, Hey, how's everything going? I'm like, you're sick. <laughs> like, we're good. We'll, we'll see you when you get better. And it was just like, they want right. to know what's happening. Um, you yeah. know, when we sign a job, I have confetti poppers that we run into the office and I pop confetti all over the office. <laughs> it's, it's small things. I mean, like it's so small to do it. that. But then we, you know, our champagne or whatever, whatever works. Yeah. Like that's, that's what works for my girl. So. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. Uh, Jenna's tips on system software and tools. Uh, I know company cam is a big part of it. I know there's obviously systems in place that you have, but if you were, this is going to dovetail a little bit into my question because I want to tap into your expertise because I think this is really interesting. You go from a completely different industry to Acadian. Okay, now you're there. And now it's like, okay, I got to put processes in place. If you, what with what you learned doing that at Acadian, let's say you were someone else and you had to go do what you just did again. What did you mm -hmm. learn from that experience and through the systems and software and stuff that you put in place would you do anything different to kind of get you to where you are now? Or were you pretty much on track with like, oh no, that's those, I, I implemented those, that didn't work. I got this into place, that did work. I cleaned up this, this process got, I guess, what did you kind of learn from that? And what would you tell somebody else that was walking into a similar situation or just their own company where they said, I just want to start at ground zero. And I just want to get us to a place where I feel like I can wrap my arms around it. Everybody's engaged. Is it starting with training? Kind of what's the, what are those early, early things that you would say you learned? I mean, it, this, everything that I'm saying right now was definitely not something that I learned by myself. Um, there's a million things that you can get on the internet and read and all these classes, but my basic find a mentor, get yeah. a mentor in this, surround yourself with people or a person that can really drive you to want to do better within your own industry or a different industry. Our owner of Acadian house, um, her name is Angela Poirier is a, a powerhouse within our industry. She has so much knowledge to give. And I was a sponge, anything she said I would take in. Um, I don't regret anything that I've implemented. I really don't. Um, mm. I think everything that we put in place now, it is ever changing and always improving. We're not perfect. There are things within CompCam that I implement and I'm like, oh, that was not good. And so I, I pull it out immediately. I'm like, Does pause, we're not gonna do that. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I've learned is like, you have to be moldable. You have to be able to kind of mm. go with the flow, especially with remodeling. And it's not a new build. It's not a fresh slate. Like you're going to have these things that you're going to have to. And for me with healthcare, you know, stopping at healthcare, like I had to get rid of some bad habits. I really did have to get some, one bad habit was in healthcare, especially in surgery, there is no, we'll finish tomorrow. No, <laughs> there's no, oh, we'll finish tomorrow. So obviously within this industry, I had to realize you can wait on it. This can wait. There are yeah. many things that people are putting on their plate and burning out and quiet quitting. Mm -hmm. It's okay to wait till the next day. That I will say that's probably the one thing that I do regret is that I didn't learn fast enough or I didn't I didn't accept that fast enough. Like 
it can wait. Those things that need to be implemented, it doesn't have to do it today. You can wait until it's a better time within your company. Um, again, I look at workload all the time. If it is not a good time to change things for our, our company, I'm not doing it yet. No matter how good it could be, I'm not going to do it because change is not going to help the uh, uh, if it's, you know, if, if we're overworking or overloading our employees. So being adaptable to your environment, um, especially if you're moving from one um, industry to the next, or if you're starting your own business, I mean, jump into whatever it is and, and try and soak up as much as you can, but also know that there is time. There's time. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic, Jenna. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I just, I feel like we could talk for two more hours and, and the yeah. questions were great. And I just think there's so much to gather from this. And it's cool because I, I love the process of, you know, folks getting better and everybody kind of charging in the same direction. And so I just And I am, is... I'm an open book. So anything that, you know, I mean, you can, I think they're going to put all the information to contact yeah. us on, on the website and stuff yeah. like that. Please reach out. Yeah. I'm I'd love to do a zoom individually if you'd like. That's that's fantastic. Well, Jenna, I can't thank you enough. I don't see any more questions today. So I think we got to all of them. Thank goodness. I did not miss any. Of course, that means I probably did. Uh, but if, if so, like Jenna said, we're going to put her information in the recap blog, which will be out within the week. And obviously we'll have this up on YouTube as well. And uh, so everybody can watch it or you can share it with those that weren't able to attend today. Jenna, you are amazing. Thank you so much for the time. This was awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. You bet. Have a good day, everybody.